So, the recording has started. I love it. Anyway, um, all right, so uh, we are uh, here to continue our uh, online training for Train the Trainer, uh, but I, I did want to allow uh, the Lord uh, to lead us in this. Uh, Dr. Bell, would you please lead us off in prayer? Yes, sir, I will. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Glory you. to God. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we come to you on tonight. Lord God, we say thank you. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to come together, Lord God, as we do our train the trainer class on this evening. We thank God for each and every person that is on the line. Continue to bless, Lord God. Open up our understanding, Lord, so that we will be effective as we teach others, Lord God, so that others may learn more about you. Yes. And Father God, we thank you for the instructor on tonight. Continue to bless him for his faithfulness, his dedication, Lord. Continue to bless his ministry, Lord God, in a mighty way. And God, we just give you the glory and the praise. And we do come against any technical difficulties on tonight, God. You are in control of all situations. And we pray that you will be in the midst of this training session on tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. And those that are on their way, God, we ask that you bless them, Lord God, as they may make their way on the call on tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Thank God and amen. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, give a, a kind of a shout out uh, as I was going through the uh, uh, our old documents from our training. I wanted to look for any instructors whose bios we were still missing, and so I just started to put together a list of all the instructors who had offered to teach each semester going all the way back to 2011, believe it or not, <laughs> fall of 2011. And uh, that was Dr. Spann. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, I think it was yeah, the spring of 2013, we had 14 instructors. So um, we should be adding to that cadre and um, you know, in the long run, we should be able to do more. But if you notice in, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, we tend to be going a little downhill in terms of size. Now, I realize that ministries do wax and wane, but um, I also know that Dr. Uh, Wells is planning on speaking to the Board of Bishops at Holy Convocation about CHMJI and um, she is of the opinion that there is going to be a large influx of both uh, prospective uh, jurisdictions, uh, affiliate jurisdictions, and prospective students. Well that being said, the first thing they're going to ask is what courses do you teach? So if we don't have instructors and if we're not prepared to, you know, teach as uh, we have been, uh, it's going to be kind of a disappointment. So I want to make sure that everybody is uh, gearing their minds up for the uh, spring semester 2019 uh, and uh, please offer yourselves to be available um, so that we have something that we can be proud of and we can share with the Church of God in Christ at large, and uh, they will uh, take a look at it and say, "Yep, I, you know, sign me up." So that's my uh, my <coughs> my cheering speech for everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, anyone that uh, is going through the course at the moment, including you, Dr. Turner, and Sister mm -hmm. Patricia. Please uh, send me your bios. I anticipate that there will be no problems um, getting you uh, acquainted with and familiar with everything you need in order to be successful as an online teacher. So uh, I, I would ask that you send me your bios as well. 
So, okay. um, oh, I still have my yellow from before. I apologize. Um, so, all right. Uh, I wanted to, let me see. Let me get my little racetrack going here. Here we go. Here's our racetrack that I tend to uh, use. And you notice we are right about here at the end of September, getting ready to go into October. So at this point, we should be relatively acquainted with Moodle and how it operates. We should know about hardware and software and um, its use uh, and lighting, Dr. Turner, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, whatever is effective, that's, that's excellent. That's a great idea. So um, we are now going to be rounding the corner into focusing almost entirely on not only uh, Moodle course preparation and use, but also um, uh, techniques for actual online teaching. So uh, we're going to get here, we have uh, section three, online teaching techniques, uh, section five, measurement tools, design and upload, and we are still continuing on with course document preparation and upload. So that's where we're at for the next couple weeks. Um, and uh, if anybody has any uh, questions or wishes to go back and cover anything in reference to Moodle generally or hardware and software generally, just let me know and we will be uh, happy to go back with those as well. Uh, Hello, any, yes, ma'am. Good question. Mm -hmm. Over, uh, instead of the headset, you mentioned having the earbuds or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the recommendation for that? Um, well, let me show you what I have. Um, if, if you have a telephone, a cell phone, those earbuds will work uh -huh. as well. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Anything that has this, this little, it's called a three and a half millimeter plug, uh, trying to get it to okay. where you can see it. Here, I'll do it. There. You should be able to see it in the front there. And that just goes okay. into, in this case, my iPhone plugs right in. And that actually okay. works in your computer as well, I in most computers. I'll say okay. most. Okay. Um, some computers have two connector uh, jacks that are small, round ones like this. Uh, most of the newer ones have a single one. If it has a single mm -hmm. connector on the side, then this will work. And okay. this, again, <laughs> this was probably four dollars or something. Uh, okay. Not even, not even a, a big issue. And like I said, these headsets. Uh, this headset I bought at Walmart for fourteen ninety nine. So. Um, mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. don't have something for your phone, uh, you might see about something like this. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they're, they're not that expensive. Don't go for the great big monster gamer headsets or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, again, the, the features that you need to be effective online are quite uh, minimal compared to all the stuff that's out there that people try and sell you. So um, okay. if you have a, an iPhone with a head, set of headphones, they'll work in your computer in most okay. cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Certainly. Hello, Lord. Yes, ma'am. Um, this might, uh, well, this question I have uh, might be a little bit, uh, <laughs> you might say silly, but I was wondering um, when you play back the recorded recorded mm -hmm. sessions, mm -hmm. is there a way that I can speed it up so I won't have to listen to an hour and a half session? Oh, you know, that's a very good one. I don't know. Let's go out onto YouTube and take a look and see if there's any way to speed up a playback. I, I hadn't even thought of that, but let's just say... Uh, Okay, there's a radio thing. Now, I'm going to turn the volume off, but is there any way to speed it up? Translations. 
You know, that is a tremendously good question. Uh, I, or, yes, sir. You can actually slide, generally, uh, right. the play slide to mm -hmm. any spot that you desire in a presentation on YouTube. Right. But so the, if you go up to oh, the... Oh, uh, Here we go. Speed normal. There we go. Yeah, All right. right. You can use so, that as well, yes. Yeah, you can, you can do double speed there. Good. I'm glad. I was looking at it going, is, is there somewhere out there? Good evening, Dr. or Elder Staten. I didn't realize you had joined us. So, good evening. Um, That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That. But also, right, Elder Ward, right where you, uh, toward the bottom of your video, there is a slider right above the pause button. Yes. Yes. You can click on along that line. And mm -hmm. it will skip to the point that you want. So that may be something else that she uh, yep. that okay. might get. Yes, that'll help you to skip to the portion of the of the recording mm -hmm. that you want. Right. And let me bring up and one with a little more detail to it. Oh, there's an ad. Okay, so uh, you can, you know, jump to various places within the recording. Now the mm -hmm. challenge is knowing where to jump within right. that recording. Mm -hmm. um, but right. this will allow you to jump forward and backward to where mm -hmm. you like. But you can also, if you click on the little settings thing, you can change the speed here uh, to either speed up or slow down, up to two times speed. Okay. And hopefully I don't sound too much like a chipmunk if you do two times speed. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. That was a good question. Thank I have you. never tried to play a YouTube video at an increased speed, but I guess you know, not everybody has an hour and a half to spend watching mm -hmm. them, so that makes a lot of sense. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, so uh, I was going to cover, oh, I was going to start in uh, with the Moodle. First off, has everyone been able to uh, spend some time this month taking a look at the courses available uh, for you to consider teaching in the spring? Um, in other words, taking advantage of the virtual open house. It goes until, um, what did I say, October 8th, and then I'm going to remove access to everyone and put us back the way we be began. Uh, so, you know, please, if you can, uh, take a look at the courses, uh, spend a little time and say, is this, a the, is this course in suitable shape for me to teach? Uh, if so, you know, can I make myself available? And it can be any day of the week, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had uh, one elder at our church uh, was a uh, military member, and as such, he had his time was extremely limited, and the only time that he would teach was Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. Okay. Um, additionally when Dr. Spann was teaching, mm -hmm. she had a number of students that were in Hawaii, which is a six-hour difference from us here in the East Coast. And she would actually start her training at 9 p.m. and teach till almost 11 um, on a weeknight. Uh, so it's just totally up to you, you know, how you teach and where you teach. Um, the uh, important thing is that you consider being uh, making yourself available to teach so that we will have students sign up. Okay. okay. So I'm going to give a little bit of information on the uh, question banks and the questions within the question bank so that we can start thinking about our measurements uh, within our courses. And let's see, I'm going to go down to local and special use. I'm going to 
Let's see if I have something here. I'm going to look at the old church administration course because I believe I have a number of questions still there. Um, so within a, a Moodle, if you remember, the one thing to remember if you are the teacher is to turn editing on. So whenever you go into your Moodle space, click that button to turn editing on. When you do, it makes all sorts of extra features visible that are not visible when you don't do that. And I will tell you, I, I can't count the number of times I've gone up and I've said, wait, something's wrong. Oh, yeah, it's me. I didn't click the little blue, blue box. So get into your Moodle space, turn editing on, and that way you'll be able to see things down here and add and edit. Um, so uh, let's say we have a uh, particular, I'm going to go down and look for a quiz. Do, do. Here we go. Uh, midterm exam. Um, here's a, an example of what we do uh, to have any sort of online teaching, uh, a measurement. And I will tell you that uh, as we're looking at it, we're going to look at uh, the questions that are included in the exam. So the important thing to remember within Moodle is you design the questions and then you put them into the exam. That's probably the best way to do it. So be thinking about the questions before you be thinking about the exam. You can actually plug questions in and just have them resident in your Moodle without even using them in what's called the question bank. So um, let's see. Actually, I'm just going to go over here to questions, uh, navigation, uh, question bank. Here it is. Okay. Now within the question bank, there are a group of questions. And I'm going to click on that. and one of the important things you'll notice is that these questions have a format that you can play with. And let me, uh, I'll give an example here. I've got this one here called Interview 1. And I'll uh, do something with that one so you can see it immediately. But let's say this is called... Uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm trying to find out where it is. Um, I'm not seeing it. I want to edit this question. So I'm going to back out of this. I thought I said I was going to edit it. Oh, there it is. Okay, interview one. Sorry, I displayed it instead of editing it. So this is called interview one, and in the uh, question text, you have the choice of font size, font um, boldness, or, or any sort of extra features, coloration, etc. But uh, the important thing to remember is when you're when you put this all together and make it into an exam, uh, midterm, quiz, final exam, whatever, your students are going to see all of the questions together. So, for example, if I am to trying to find font, let's say I'll, I'll change the font size. Make it 18 point font and I want it bold. Oh, it, it is already bold. And I want to do color. If I had a color, where is it? There we go. Text color. And I'm going to make this a wild red color. So just so you can see, I'm going to go down and save this. And now when we look at the uh, question bank, and I go to display this, you notice it looks, you can see the, the red, the bold faced, larger font, etc. And it it's not going to match the other questions. So as you're doing this, it's really important for you 
to establish a standard for your questions, a standard font size, a standard font color, and a standard font uh, with boldface or italic or whatever, and then stick to that throughout your entire question bank. Um, this is a case for consistency, uh, so that um, well, I, I may no, I don't have it, but um, I'll I will include that in a later uh, quiz where I will put it together and you'll see it, and it is it will just point out immediately why all of your questions need to look the same. So be aware that there is a real possibility because you do these at different times that they may look a little different from each other. So get into the habit of putting them all in the same format so that when you put them all together in your quiz or exam they appear to be one contiguous exam. Uh, also when you look at the each of the questions that are here uh, it shows for example uh, who created it and when it was created who last modified it so if there are multiple uh, instructors in the same Moodle space you'll see which are, for lack of a better term, your questions and which are questions for the other instructors. And uh, you can actually uh, click up here to sort by surname, for example. So if it was created by you know, someone else other than you, it will sort differently than you, your name. Mm -hmm. So uh, that will allow you to get to the questions that are specifically yours. Uh, but I will tell you that many people have questions that can be used throughout the course. You don't have to look for, uh, you don't have to make questions all yourself simply because you think they're needed. Take a look at the questions mm -hmm. that other instructors have put out there and um, they will probably uh, be quite sufficient. Now over here on the left, let's see if I can make this a little larger. Uh, control. There we go. Um, I'm making this a little larger so you can see, but there's a little icon to the left of each one of these questions, and it actually says what the it type of question it is. For example, this is an essay question. When I hover over it, it says essay. So we come down here. This one is a matching question come down here this one is multiple choice and then there's a here's a, the last one true false okay so you can actually see the types of questions simply by looking at the icon to the left now there are other types but I will tell you that the uh, the ones that I highly recommend highly recommend are multiple choice, true, false, and matching. And I will demonstrate to you why uh, those are the most important ones for you to use. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do, let's do multiple choice simply because that's one that is sort of the, the bedrock for all tests and examinations. And uh, I'm going to open it up and it's going to ask a question and it says, all of the following are taught as human relations competencies except and then it gives a, a group of, of answers here uh, A B C D E now um, when you are let's see, do you have to close that um, so for the uh, matching I'm sorry that was multiple choice and the students are going to see a particular question they're going to have a series of answers they're going to be able to choose from the various answers here's what it looks like within the Moodle when you are actually creating that question so I'll go back up to the top and it says what's the general category I don't recommend you do anything with the categories I don't recommend you do anything except for below question name and I, in this case, I put Pollock Chapter 2 6, which is literally the page on the textbook where I drew this from. Um, 
but then this one says, uh, you know, I, I put it all in the same font size, etc. And this is the question itself. Now, remember that uh, in some multiple choice questions, it could be like both B and C, or all of the above, or, or those types of things. But this one is just a um, uh, regular question, multiple choice, one answer only. You notice I, here I say only one answer will be uh, correct. Also, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but for now, please make sure you set all of your questions to one mark. And there's a reason for that. We're going to get into waiting for the exam questions. And there are some that you may want to wait more heavily um, than others. But for now, leave everything at one until you decide to apply your waiting. Um, I do not do anything with general feedback. I typically leave it empty. And so far this is one answer only for this question. And then it says, do you want to shuffle the choices? This sounds like a really simple question, but it's extremely crucial for you when you're doing this that you s select this properly. What it means by do you want to shuffle the choices, let me bring this up, if enabled, the order of the questions or the answers is randomly shuffled for each attempt. So you can have two students sitting side by side looking at the exact same um, exam on the exact same question and for one person the correct answer is B and for the other person the correct answer is D um, because it shuffles the answers. Now shuffling sounds like a great idea except when you have something that says both B and C above or all of the above because then if you shuffle your all of the above could be answer A <laughs> and there will be nothing above that so if you're do if you're referring to other questions like saying both B and C above or all of the above or none of the above or anything like that remember that you have to turn off shuffle the choices because then you will select what is A, what is B, what is C, what is D, etc. Alright, so that's a, a really important thing that people frequently overlook and it gets them in trouble because their students say it said all of the above but it was answer A. So just be aware that that, that can catch you. Uh, so uh, I leave the default for uh, A, B, C, D for the answers here and then it says here are all of the answers so choice one and you type it in and substantiation of contributions sounds good and then it says if the student selects this how much of the answer percentage wise will this student obtain so if you have, for example, two correct answers in this question, uh, like A and B, then, or I'm sorry, not A or B, let's, just, let's call it properly choice one and choice two, each one of them should be uh, set to 50%. So that if they get A and C, for example, they will have gotten 50% of the answers correctly but not all of them. So that's something that you can do within the questions. You can select the waiting for the answers. Uh, my recommendation is until you're really good at this, stick with 100% single choice answers or all of the above, both B and C above, etc. Um, that way you won't confuse yourself uh, when you're trying to do this. So in this case, I set this for 100% substantiation of contributions is the proper answer for this one. A church must present a receipt to any single gift donor of $250 or more reflecting the total amount given and the date it was given. This requirement is known as and the proper answer is substantiation of contributions. That is the single correct answer. Remember I said it for single 
And then we have uh, distractors. Choice number two, deductible disclosure, grade none. If they answer that, they get 0% of that answer correct. Uh, number three, charitable contributions, none. They don't get that one correct. Deductible substantiation, grade none. And then uh, let's say you uh, want to do more than, in this case, we have four choices. So you want to do five or six or seven. Uh, all you do is come down here and say blanks for three more choices. When you click on it, it will add now five, six, and seven. I'm going to go back down to where we were. One, two, oh, it's still catching up. Come on, Moodle. It says, hey, the web page is slowing down your browser. Okay, that's fine. So here we go. All right, choice one, choice two, choice three, choice four. That's what we had to start with. And then because I clicked on that, we now have a choice five, choice six, and choice seven. You don't have to use them three at a time. For example, if I only want choice five, then all I do is I select, this is now choice five. The answer is none of uh, these selections or something like that. And that's a grade of none. Um, and I just leave six and seven blank. Then when I save it, do, 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 I'm going to save the changes here. I will now have a total of five selections for that particular question. So, and I forgot which one it was. Pollock 2 6, chapter 2 6, there it is. So, I'm going to open this one up and say, here we are, you know, within the question, there are now five. And remember the, the one that I did, the fifth one is now selection D. The reason is I selected to shuffle. Mm -hmm. So remember that. That's what it looks like when you shuffle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions so far? I realize I'm doing this quickly, but I record it so you can go back and look at it. Any questions? Okay. So this was a multiple choice. Um, and I'm going to uh, show you a couple other ones uh, to get you your mind going on this. Uh, here is a matching question. And I'm going to display it so you see what it looks like when the students take it. Pollock recommends a four-step plan to help reduce a church's likelihood of experiencing child abuse or child sexual abuse event, etc., etc. And then it says, match the steps in order with their descriptions. In other words, step one, step two, step three, step four, straight out of the textbook. And then you have to give qualifiers. Remember that not all of your students are adept at completing an exam, uh, so you have to tell them what success looks like. What I mean by that is if you say, uh, you may select one, more than one, or not at all. You know, any of those things that, that you put into the exam, it's your responsibility to tell the students how to answer properly. So if you say, select two answers, it should go right in here. So this says you must match all four in order to receive credit for this question. Not all descriptions you see will be used. And I did that on purpose because if you select three and you think you're right, well, then you say, oh, well, then the last one must be the fourth. So, of course, I put in five so that the students aren't going to get to the three they think they know right and then select the remaining one to be the fourth one. So I put in five. That is an excellent distractor. Uh, it keeps the students from guessing. Um, so you can put that in. Now, uh, again, uh, if I'm going to go back and show this within the edit, so you can see, that was this one. 
I will edit it and we will look at how that question is arranged in the Moodle as well. Again, uh, don't worry about categories or anything like that. Go down to question name and begin at that point. There must be something going on at my ISP today. Okay, so question name. Again, Pollock Chapter 4-2. And if you take a look at it, it's the exact same font as the other one was. Mm -hmm. Standardize your fonts. And default mark of 1. So this is going to be set just like all of the other questions. You're not going to run into a question that all of a sudden your students are, are getting, you know, 105% or something on their exams because somebody inadvertently set this to 10 or something like that. Um, leave them all at 1 at this point. Any quiz question that you design, leave it at a default mark of 1 for now. Again, general feedback, I typically leave empty. I selected not to shuffle. Um, so this says, uh, you oh, uh, this is for us as we're designing this within the Moodle. It says a matching type question has to have at least two questions and three answers. Now you can have three and three, four and four, eight and eight. I frequently do eight. Um, if I'm doing like, um, let's say, historic events in Church of God in Christ, um, you know, when was uh, Bishop Mason born? Where was Bishop Mason born? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Where did he receive the uh, uh, idea from the Lord about naming the church the Church of God in Christ? And where was he at the time? You know, and all of those, you put them all together, and it's practically your church history in one question. But uh, remember I said to make it one point to start with. Well, later on I'll show you how to turn that eight into eight points uh, on the uh, final exam. So it'll have that weight so that each selection you make uh, will be part of the exam uh, overall instead of just being right or wrong for that particular question. They could get a whole bunch of them right and miss one. You don't want to give them... Uh, a negative rating for just missing one of those eight selections. So uh, this says entries where both question and answer are blank will be ignored. Remember in the multiple choice if you left it blank it didn't show up. Remember we had six and seven uh, that I didn't put anything in there so they just didn't show up. Well it's the same way with a with a matching question. So this says, step one, selecting volunteers and staff. So this is going to be on the left-hand side, and this is going to be one of the possibilities on the drop-down. Step two, another, uh, uh, and sorry, this is the correct selection for step one. But it will show up as one of the selections in the drop-down. Step two, there's the correct selection. Step three, correct selection. Step four, correct selection. Step five, I left blank. I didn't do anything with question five, but here's my distractor. That is not going to be correct for any of them. So you can, just so long as you have more answers than you have selections, you can do it that way. And I do recommend you don't do the exact same numbers 4 and 4, 5 and 5, 3 and 3. Um, that, that only allows the students to test you know, their, their basic knowledge but not their uh, thorough knowledge of the question. So uh, I don't do very much with the rest of these as well. Uh, it is possible to do what's called um, um, it's not on this one, but on some of these, it in, it allows you to do feedback within the question. Uh, yeah, there it is. If you get the response correct, uh, you can actually say that's right, or something like that. 
And for any partially correct, mm -hmm. try again. You know, something like that. You can do that within the question itself. So when they do select it, uh, it can actually give immediate feedback. I don't really um, focus on that. It, it takes a lot of work to design questions already uh, that are going to work this way. So uh, I, I just typically leave that empty. Uh, multiple tries. Here's a good one. Let's say uh, you have a particular uh, exam and you want your students to take it more than once. But if they take it a second time, here is where you can apply a penalty for even if they get it correct on their second attempt and you don't want it to be uh, fully, uh, fully counted, uh, you can actually put a penalty. For example, you can say, well, uh, I only want, uh, I want 10% penalty if they, on second and subsequent tries, they'll only get 0.9 of the one point uh, for, their, uh, for their exam. You can do penalties here. And this basically says, if you're going to allow them to test more than once, in other words, attempt this a second time, do you want to put a uh, penalty in for that particular question? It's just the question. Okay? Any questions so far? I'm covering this real quick. Any questions? Okay, so um, the uh, let me describe a little bit. I showed you the um, Oh, multiple choice and matching. Let me show you a true-false, and then I will explain to you why I recommend those three types. Uh, so we're going to examine this one. This is a true-false. And it says, a church is not required to incorporate in order to gain tax-exempt status from the federal government. And then here I put something in there that actually tells them this is a true-false question. Select one or the other. And uh, they can select it. In fact, I'm going to show you this. Let's say we're going to submit it. When you do questions within the Moodle, this is the feedback that I put into it. Remember I said I don't do feedback very often? Well, in this case, I did feedback within the question that says if they select a correct answer, I put down that's correct. It's interesting to note that a church is not required to incorporate in order to gain tax-exempt status from the federal government. Page 23. I literally referred to the textbook uh, page where they can go back and double-check their answers. The correct answer is true. And you notice there's this green little checkbox check mark uh, saying yes you got it correct if I had start again if I had selected false and I'm going to submit and finish it gives a little red X paints this whole thing pink and I put again feedback no sorry it's interesting to note and this is uh, straight out of the textbook you notice I, I quoted this the correct answer is true. So you can do that, but again, it takes a lot of work. So that was true-false matching and multiple choice. Now here's why Elder Ward thinks they're such a great idea. Let's say we're going to take a look at this one, and this is a... Uh, oh, there's our goofy fonts. Uh, and it says, how did you become the church administrator and what is your greatest joy in serving in this position? So this was just a, a question answer with my church administrator. But the important thing to note here is, even if the answer is, let's say, um, uh, Tuesday, and you know, you've got Tuesday... 
and they select to submit and finish, Moodle will automatically correct, I'm sorry, it will automatically um, grade your answers, but only if you tell Moodle what the correct answer is. So in, in an essay type question, you have to know exactly what students are going to type, including punctuation, including um, spacing. Uh, they have to spell everything correctly. If they don't know how to spell Deuteronomy, you're in trouble because it will grade them and say, you didn't get this right because they spelled Deuteronomy wrong. So uh, the reason why I really uh, do recommend true, false, multiple choice, mm -hmm. and matching is that the students select something. They don't have to type something. But if you do, let's see, uh, I'm just going to create a new question. And here are the various question types. Calculated, multiple choice, simple, embedded answer, which is called a close. If you've ever done CLOZE exams, this will accept mm -hmm. closed questions. Essay, matching multiple choice, numerical, random short answer, even a short answer. Let's say short answer here, um, and we're going to add it. And uh, so the question name is going to be delete me uh, because I don't want this to stay anywhere within the exam or my Moodle. So I'm going to say something like um, what follows uh, Thursday. And default mark of one, general feedback. Answer number one, Friday. And I'm going to give it a 100% grade. Looks really simple, doesn't it? But what happens if somebody types Friday with two Ys? They still typed Friday. But because Moodle will only examine the exact text that you've put in there, as being correct, if they if they have any misspelling, or uh, let me uh, just get a little bit wild here, fry space day, that will be graded as incorrect within Moodle. So, for you, for your sanity, for your sense of well-being. I do recommend that you stick to true, false, multiple choice, and matching type questions, especially if you get a large class. Because you'll end up doing just like you hated to do when you were an educator, and that's spend hours each day grading papers. Because you have to read them all. Let Moodle do the heavy lifting. True, false, multiple choice, matching. Uh, I will say that until you finish this course. <laughs> I won't stop reminding you that uh, if you can use them. Now, um, let me put a little uh, perspective into this. Remember that a, a lot of people um, have a history that involves college. So in their minds, they're thinking, I'm teaching adults, so I'm going to use the same things that were used for me when I went for, let's say, my bachelor's degree. Within the Church of God in Christ, uh, this was a survey that was conducted in 2011. They uh, identified that the average education level of a minister who accepts the call to ministry and uh, begin his uh, formational training to become an elder, the average education level is 10th grade within the Church of God in Christ, which means that the average education level of the people that you could be teaching is high school. So if you design this to be a college course, you could end up leaving some people behind because they are not prepared for college courses yet. 
So be aware that this, uh, the way I think about it, if you remember, um, like, uh, domain names within, across the internet, there's harvard.edu, there's, uh, well, Dr. Bell, umuc.edu, there's, you know, capitalcollege.edu. So think about that as being a college. But then the other ways of learning, if you remember Lincoln Tech or those sorts of things, those are like trade schools. Those are uh, not degree-granting organizations, and yet they have a very valuable role in training people to do things uh, in whatever the industry they're in, or in this case, their ministries. So I think about it in reference to uh, we're not a college, we're more along the lines of a trade school. But it's a trade school for ministry. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Any any questions so far? True, false, multiple choice, matching. I won't stop <laughs> reminding you. Uh, I want to leave the page. And um, the uh, you just saw how those questions are designed. Remember to leave each question at one point for now. Uh, we will work on getting them all assembled together. Oh, I have time to do it. So I'm going to go back and go to that same course that we were just looking at. Uh, local and special use, and it's hidden. I should call that ch admin old, but anyway. And let's see, am I still editing? I think I am. Wait until it finishes. <laughs> yep, here I am. I'm still editing. So we're going to go back down to these exams that we were looking at. Oh, that's right. I zoomed in a little bit. So I'll put it back a little bit uh, in terms of size. Now, um, as you want to put together an exam of some sort, remember that the questions can be assembled at any time. So one of the first things you should do when you have a Moodle course is to put together your questions. Just put them all out there together. Uh, don't worry about assembling them into exams. Build your supply of questions like you saw within this course. You saw within the question bank there was a, a significant number of questions, um, all of which can be used or not. It's your choice. Uh, at any time within this particular um, uh, course, within this Moodle. So uh, here we are, and we are, I'm going to go back to the course page. All right, we're back up at the top, and if we want to design a an exam, let's say we're going to do a quiz uh, on topic two, I'm going to say I'm going to add an activity or resource. Uh, now, in reference to Moodle, Moodle calls all exams quizzes. So you're not going to find one here that says final exam or midterm exam. They're all called quizzes. So if you want to do an exam, it's called a quiz. All right, so we're going to add a quiz. And we're going to call this quiz 2, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to leave the description blank. Um, uh, not going to worry about a description uh, for that. Now, here we go into the actual information on how to do your quiz uh, format. 
how long are the students going to have to take your quiz? That's under timing. You can also, now this shows how long they will do it. I say, okay, I want them to be able to do it for uh, 30 minutes. But also, and here's something very powerful, you can have a quiz and set it to start on a particular date and stop on a particular date. Now, that sounds really good to start with, but be aware that if a student misses that for some reason like, oh, I don't know, their spouse went into the hospital and they were unable to do that quiz, you have set it to where Moodle will turn that quiz off for that student whether or not they're it, that was a good re thing to do. So be aware frequently when you've enabled time limits for a particular exam. Oh, that's fine, Elder Staten, I, I do understand. Uh, but um, you can set time limits, but there could be a detriment to that. So just realize that it's not you're going to run into a, a circumstance where your student's going to say, can you reopen the exam for me? And you're going to feel inclined to do so. So this is when you can say, I want the quiz to start a particular date and time, end a particular date and time. Um, how long will the quiz be? In this case, I'm saying I want it to be 30 minutes in length. Um, and when, let's say a student is taking the exam, but they haven't finished all their questions. You can actually say, what are we going to do if the students are still taking their questions at the time this 30 minutes expires? And I, I will say, okay, open attempts are submitted automatically. In other words, you get credit for what you've done up to this point. Okay, and then it says for submission, do you want a grace period? No. I want them to do it within the time period that I've requested. And then it asks, what will the grade be? Now, there are, uh, there, you have the capability of putting uh, numbers in here. Oh, okay. Connection is not secure. So if you want to put, it's not secure. All right. So the grade to pass in this case, I'm going to say is going to be 10. And the reason is, in my mind, I'm putting together 10 questions. So that's where that number is going to match your questions and your weighting. Now, here's a question that I always put forth to career educators. You are used to measuring students uh, to a particular level, like 70% or 80% or 60% for their completion and saying if they get 70%, that's good enough for them to uh, have demonstrated enough knowledge to move on to the next uh, subject. Within the Church of God in Christ, I have an approach and I call it that I, I give everyone an easy A. I guess that's a way of saying it because I want the students to know everything that I'm teaching them. And what I mean by that is, if you learn 80% of how to be a, a good church administrator in this case, is that enough? I don't know. For me, as I'm training you, I want you to be as proficient in all of the steps not just most of them, in, in all of the techniques, not just most of them, uh, within use of Moodle online. This is your last opportunity to learn this sort of thing unless you go out and try and learn it yourself. So me personally, I set this for unlimited attempts allowed. If you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you can say one attempt or two attempts. Remember there was the penalty if you take it more than, than once. Uh, you can say that, but in my case, I set it to unlimited. And let me tell you what that does for me. When I do an exam, I take into account that the students are going to be trying to take this multiple times. 
because it's rare for them to get 100% to start with. But if I allow them, and I, by the way, I'm shuffling everything within the, the, both the questions and the answers. So they're not going to go, okay, so the fourth one was D. They're not going to be able to do that the way I set it up. Because the fourth, the fourth question could now be the second question. And answer D within that second question is now A. Because it shuffles automatically. So they can't get into a habit of saying, you know, it was four was D. It's not going to work. So I do unlimited attempts, and the students, they attempt it until they get 100%. So they'll do it over and over and over again until they've answered all of the questions correctly. And it's, to me, it's not random. It's repetitive. And I do that on purpose. I want them to get every question 100%. And that's just my approach. Um, it makes my students all feel like they're, you know, doing so well grade-wise, but I also insert repetitive learning in there even as I am measuring them for their proficiency. So, highest grade possible. Uh, how do you grade? Do you grade by highest grade, average grade, first attempt, last attempt? Uh, in my case, I usually leave them at highest grade. In other words, if you uh, got it right, you know, got an 80% the first time you tested and a 70 the second time, you will still have an 80% for your exam when it finishes. Uh, layout, do you want it all on one question or do you want uh, the the page to change every few questions. Um, I put, I say all questions on one page and then they just scroll. Within the question, they say, here we go. Do you want to shuffle the questions? And I'm going to show that. If enabled, the parts making up each question will be randomly shuffled each time a student attempts the quiz. Provided the option is also enabled in the question settings. So the question, if you set the question to not shuffle, this will not change it. That's what it's saying. Only applies to questions with multiple parts, such as multiple choice or matching. Okay. Review options, after the quiz is closed, uh, during the attempt, what are they allowed to see? I never do anything inside here. I just leave it the way Moodle set it up. Question appearance, show the user's picture while they are taking the exam. No. Uh, do, you, do you use decimal points in the grades? I typically don't. I set it to zero decimal points mm -hmm. because a 78.62% is yeah. to me the same as a 79%. Mm -hmm. So that's where decimal points will throw you. Remember to put that in each time you design your quiz to say zero decimal points. You mm -hmm. notice the default when I brought it up, it said two. So mm -hmm. be aware of that. Uh, extra re restrictions on attempts. Oh. There we go. Extra restrictions on attempts. Uh, do you want them to require a password, etc., etc.? Do you enforce a delay between the first and second e attempt? In other words, you want them to wait a day before they take their second attempt? You can do that as well. Um, and browser security, uh, I, I don't do anything with that one. Um, I just leave that. Overall feedback when they're done, uh, if they got 100%, oh, oh, yeah, if they got 100%, what do you say? If they got, let's say, 90%, what do you say? If they got 80%, what do you say? You can put that in here and it provides immediate feedback as soon as the student completes their exam. And I'm going to cancel that because I don't really want anything else in there. But that's how you design the question. Oh, I canceled. <sighs> okay, well, I'm going to go down to one that I've already designed. 
because when you do that, and I, I selected that incorrectly, but here, I'll go to this midterm exam, and I'm editing it. Here we go. Now, this was what we had uh, with the other information. You notice timing, grade, layout, question behavior, extra restrictions on attempts. So this is a, a Moodle exam. And then I say, save and display. And when I do, da, 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 da. no, this wasn't what I wanted. Um, it's supposed to give you, I'll go back to the beginning. It's supposed to give you the option to add questions. Church administration. And at that point, it will open your question bank. And you can, I'm going to have to do this quickly. I'm just going to add. There we go. I'm going to add a quiz. I'll say add. I'm going to give it a name rather quickly, and then I'll just go down to the very bottom. Just call it whatever I want. Go down, uh, save and display. I think it's save and display. Yep, here it goes. And it says, no questions have been added yet. All right, so right now, this quiz has no questions. So let's go edit the quiz. And add from the question bank. And now it brings up the question bank that we were in. And I can say, well, I want this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And I can just select whatever questions I've already put into the question bank. And, okay, that's enough. Add selected questions to the quiz. Maximum grade 10, save. And believe it or not, we just created a quiz that quickly. So let's go back here to... Uh, church admin, and we'll go find that quiz. That's why you create all your questions first, because then you can just do like this and create quizzes all the time. Okay, here's the quiz, and I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to give it a try. Attempt quiz now. Remember, I told everybody, remember to make all of your fonts the same. Well, if you look at this, oh, it's set for, there's question one, question two. So this was set one, one page per question. Question three, question four, etc. The students will actually have a navigation bar here, which has all of the question numbers and they can move back and forth. I'll go back to question one, and there it is. Mm -hmm. So let's say I've selected one, and I'm going to go to two, and I've done a selection on two, and I go to three. Notice what's happening over here to the right. It shows that one and two are grayed out, which means that your student can use this as they're navigating to see, whoops, stay on page. Uh, I, so now I'm going to go to 6, and I'm going to select true, and then I'll go back to 4. So as the students look at this, it says, I, the student, have completed 1, 2, 3, and 6 of this quiz, but I haven't completed 4 and 5. So this is a, a great tool that Moodle automatically puts into the quiz, or final exam or midterm exam so that they can know how far along they are. It allows them to jump back and forth between questions, etc. before they say they're going to finish. I'm going to go, I think it's at 
at the end of 6. So I'll go to 6 and next so this says I've done 1, 2, 3, and 6. I haven't yet answered 4 and 5 so that matches with this but I say well I want to submit all and finish it's going to say are you sure you want to do that it will do the same thing for the students are you sure you want to submit because once you do your exam is finished so I say yes I want to submit all and finish and it says it actually shows what questions I got correct in this case I got question one correct just by grabbing information out of, um, you know, I, I didn't even look at the answers. I just selected. But this is where you can put your feedback. It is helpful for your students if you have time for it. This is feedback within the question that says, if they got this right, what do you what do you show them? And then for this one. They got it wrong. I didn't put any other information except the correct answer is substantiation of contributions. This one, I provided some feedback. Instruct church workers to assist in the investigation by admitting guilt if they played a part in the accident. So uh, you can put all of that into your quizzes so your students immediately know their grades. In my case, my grade wasn't that good. I got a 17%. But that's what uh, Moodle will do for your students. That's what Moodle will do for you uh, for testing. Um, the important thing is to remember, and yeah, that's enough for this evening. I think I've probably filled your heads. But the important things to remember mm -hmm. are to make your questions consistent so they look the same when you plug them all in together then they will all look like they're on the same exam and this wasn't one you designed on Tuesday and this was one you designed on Thursday and they're different fonts or different colors or whatever make your questions consistent then you can do just like I did toss them all in together saved done I've just made a quiz okay that makes sense yeah. and again I know I did this quickly the good news is we will cover this for at least the next four weeks um, quiz questions oh, let's see dr. Bell are you still on yes sir I'm still here I'm okay still here. Um, what what if you were to say uh, one of the most complex things that they will need to do in Moodle, would you agree that one of them is probably designing their quizzes correctly? Absolutely. Yeah, I think it, that is one of the most complex pieces of the uh, system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm mm -hmm. trying to give you the, the proper approach to doing this and a lot of a head start to say this is where you begin. Um, even more so than doing your slide decks for example uh, go back to your textbooks pull your questions out put them into your question bank and then you can arrange them any way you like down the road any other questions okay I wanted to sort of finish up with course development I have a uh, slide deck on how to uh, do your question names Let's see if I can find it Moodle question names there we go and this is just something that I uh, sort of recommend for you in reference to how you name your Moodle questions if you remember some of the examples I gave I referred to the textbook and I referred to the chapter within the textbook and in some cases you can even refer to the page 
for your Moodle question names. Now, why is that so important? What if you are one of multiple instructors that are using that quiz bank with all of those questions? If you put a question named question four, then none of the other instructors will be able to understand what that question is until they actually open it and read it. But if you say um, uh, something along chronology of the um, Old Testament kings, then they will immediately understand what you are measuring there. So remember, and I'll go through this and describe it, uh, written individually or uploaded, you can put your uh, questions into Moodle. There, You can upload using like Hot Potatoes or Gift. Um, I recommend that you know that before you try. Um, Elder Gant and Elder Void are best at that, I believe. Um, but again, to upload it, you have to use very, very precise syntax. Uh, and remember to give each question a distinct name. And I will talk about those names in a second, but when you create the question, you give it a name. And right down here it says question name, and it's currently blank. You can change those names at any time. They're not going to be stuck with you for the rest of your life. Um, but they are never visible in the exams themselves. That's important. So, for example, if you say um, uh, uh, Bishop, uh, I'm sorry, Bishop Blake's uh, church name is West Angeles Church of God in Christ, you can actually name that in the question, but the students will never see that. So, don't worry about having an answer in the actual description of the question. The students will never see question names. So I say names should be descriptive. Why? What difference does it make? Well, look at this. Question name, quiz one. So what can you tell from this? Chapter 10-12-1, chapter 10-12-10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 2, 3, whatever. Well, you can at least tell that it's a particular chapter within the textbook. You can tell the likely order in which it was taught because they're numbered 1, 2, 3, 10, 11, 12, etc. Uh, and, oh, this is chapters 10 through 12. And what can you determine? Well, you can determine also where you plan to uh, do your measurement. These are going to be questions that I'm going to use in the midterm. These are questions that I'm going to use in a quiz for the New Testament survey, etc. Okay? What can you determine from these? Rejected views, first creed name, which creed answers questions? Formula for water baptism. Scriptures supporting the SOF. See the difference here. When you name these very, very specifically, look, 308, 309, 310, 11, 12, other, uh, other instructors will be able to immediately discern what you're doing, and oh, by the way, it even has the exam or the question type. So you can say, on the rejected views, this is a multiple choice answer or multiple choice question. So it's very helpful, not only for you when you go back and look at it three or four times, but for other instructors to see those questions and possibly use them themselves. So here's another one, Kojic founding dates. Date the Kojic faction embraced Pentecostalism, ecclesiastical ranks, etc. Very, very helpful rather than question four. Here's some more. Oh, here's the ones. You recognize those. Those came from the, uh, the church administration exam. 
the questions that I had put together. So here's some other ones. Intro quiz, synchronous or asynchronous, what's the CHMJI approach? Module 1, 8 tips for successful online course facilitation. In other words, I've actually named these according to what was taught within the uh, particular course. So it, you can be very helpful and so my best practice recommendation for you is to be as descriptive as you want for the question names and remember that the students will never see the question names so you can even say you know the quest the correct answer for this is going to be 14 or something like that totally okay within the question name the students will never see it I think that does it for me this evening yep I think we're done so I am going to back out of this I'm just gonna close this up did anyone have any questions before we closed up for the evening we covered a lot this evening and I fully anticipate you will be going back to look at it um, later mm -hmm. on uh, but hopefully this will be uh, helpful information you can review throughout uh, your learning uh, and like uh, Dr. Bell pointed out uh, I won't mention names but we've had an instructor that has asked the same question um, uh, multiple times and across the course of multiple attendances here in the train the trainer uh, I never get upset I never get frustrated I never lose my patience so far <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm just I'm happy to help you be successful so it don't worry about what may sound like a silly question okay. there I am here to serve you all right Thank you. so that being said I think we're all done um, uh, sister Patricia could I ask you to please finish us out in prayer Yes, God, we do thank you for all of your goodness. We just appreciate the opportunity that you have given us to come together and to learn how to share information and share your word with your people. We ask, oh God, that you help us to retain the information that we have learned on this evening and bless us as we go throughout the week until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and a wonderful worship Sunday. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Okay.